I set out to find the answers to the following questions. What is ChatGPT and how does it work? Second, how can we as educators make use of it to save ourselves time and innovate in our classrooms? Third, what are its limitations and what does it promise for the future? Perhaps you've been asking yourself the same questions. Let's find out together. ChatGBT, Bard, Claude, Llama2. These are all examples of large language models that are basically designed with a really easy user interface to sound like we're having a conversation with another human being, masking all of the complex computation that's happening in the background. So that makes sense of the word chat in ChatGBT, but what about the GPT? What does it stand for? Well, it's Generative Pre-trained Transformer. Let's break that down a little bit more. It's generative because it's capable of creating new outputs based upon the input data that we give it. It's a pre-trained transformer because it uses transformer architecture, which is a kind of neural net based on deep learning. And it is pre-trained on vast quantities of data, which are then tweaked by human engineers. You can think of a neural network in much the same way as a human brain operates. Imagine multiple layers of interconnected nodes that share and computate data and information. And just like a human brain, these neural networks evolve and learn over time, resulting in what some people refer to as emergent properties. So some of these large language models suddenly demonstrate abilities that weren't programmed in with the original data set. They can suddenly start speaking Arabic or know how to play chess as well as Go. This explosion in artificial intelligence over the last couple of years is really the result of two complementary forces. The first is advances in gaming technology, which gave the processing power needed. And the second is an increasing access to vast fields of data as companies like OpenAI, the parent company of ChatGPT, have scraped the internet. That is that with or without permission, they've gone out and basically found all of the text that's out there that can be accessed and incorporated it into their training sets. This is a Galton board. It basically brings to life the statistical concept of normal distribution or Gaussian distribution. When the device is tipped over, 3,000 little steel beads cascade downwards and they bounce between a series of equally spaced out pegs, meaning that each of the beads could go left or right as it follows its way down these rows of pegs. They eventually accumulate into the channels at the bottom and spell out what is essentially a bell curve. And it's used to demonstrate the order in the chaos of randomness. The beads don't remember their route, they simply fall towards the middle because there are more routes leading to the middle than to the outside. So this clustering naturally occurs. It's not random. The system at play imposes a predictable and repeatable order. This metaphor of the Galton board also applies with large language models, but instead of steel beads, we have words. And just as those steel beads follow the rules of Newtonian physics, Language follows the underlying rules that allow us to effectively communicate with one another. And we might not be aware of it because most of these rules we've absorbed intuitively along the way, but there are a lot of them. For example, finish the following sentence. Time flies like an... Now that phrase could have been ended with any noun. Time flies like an eagle. Time flies like an octopus. But the chances are you selected time flies like an arrow. If we were to scour the internet and find all of the occasions when that phrase time flies like Anne could be found, the majority would be funneled towards that middle choice. But language is more nuanced than even that. Let's take that phrase and mine into it a little bit deeper. In our example, we are saying time, a noun, flies, verb, like an arrow. But look what happens when we rearrange the syntax here. Let's turn time into a verb and let's make the flies the noun. Time flies like an arrow. In other words, we should time flies in the same way that we would time an arrow, should we feel inclined to want to time the movement of flies. Or, to take it one more layer of absurdity deep, 
Let's create a new noun, a compound noun, time flies, a species of nouns that have a penchant for arrows. Time flies like an arrow. So you see, language is all about context, understanding that context is king or queen. The more data a system has, the more likely it is to understand the nuances of this kind of context upon which language is predicated. So large language models like ChatGPT seem to be sentient. They give the impression of a human operator and pass our subjective Turing test because they have so much data to draw upon that they know what people sound like when they write and speak. ChatGPT2 was released in 2019 and had 1.5 billion parameters. You can think of parameters as the building blocks of data from which a model is trained and can draw upon. On average, a parameter works out to about five words, but we don't need to worry about that now. A year later, in 2020, when ChatGPT3 came out, that 1.5 billion had swelled to a stunning 175 billion. And then when ChatGPT4 came out, which is the current model as of this time of recording, in this year of 2023, it's composed of, to our best estimates, 1.7 trillion parameters. Now, these are huge numbers. And if you're anything like me, I'm an English teacher, the difference between a million, a billion and a trillion is just big numbers. So I asked ChatGPT to give me a metaphor that might help me better understand the differences between them. It turns out that if we take a parameter to be the equivalent of a second, then one million parameters would be just under 12 days, about the time we would have for a nice summer holiday. A billion, on the other hand, would be 31 years. That's the equivalent of most people's entire teaching career. But what about a trillion, I hear you ask? Well, a trillion is a staggering 31,866 years. That's more time than has passed since the Stone Age to the present day. So the difference between a billion and a trillion may seem like just two little letters, but in terms of scale, it's incomparable. Well, it can be compared because I just did, but you know what I mean. So in just four years, we've gone from 1.5 billion to 1.7 trillion parameters. And as far as we can tell, this exponential growth is continuing unabated. The only thing that's really holding back the release of new models is the availability of computing chips and legislation. And I can understand why OpenAI and other companies are holding back a little bit to see what the government's response is going to be before they invest and put out newer models that might cause even more people to get nervous about the fact that AI is going to overthrow the world and robotic overlords are going to exterminate us. So when you're playing with ChatGPT, it's basically like having a really well-read friend on speed dial 24 hours a day. And how well-read? Well, let's assume that they're immortal and that they have perfect memory recall and an average reading speed of 250 words a minute. If they'd done nothing except read for their entire life for the sole purpose of being wise counsel to you, they'd be pushing close to 65,000 years old. And ChatGPT 3 and 4 are basically general large language models. They're not designed with any one particular user in mind, but you can fine tune these large language models for specific agent purposes. So, for example, the medical industry can use it for protein folding to create new antibiotics or to be able to analyze scans for better identification of cancers. Weather forecasters can use it to better predict areas where extreme weather events may occur. And there are already conservationists using it to identify hotspots to see where wildfires might break out or the best places to plant crops in order to maximise yields. And in my opinion, we don't for the moment at least have anything to worry about AI taking our jobs. You can think of it as a tool, an augmentation, in the same way that we've been using technologies to augment our lives for centuries. We use calculators often rather than rely upon mental maths. We use cars to travel as quickly as possible from point A to point B, and yet I don't feel inferior to a car or a calculator. Without human input, there is no output for large language models, at least for the time being. And if you spend a bit of time browsing the internet and going down the rabbit hole of AI, you'll eventually come across two tribes 
On the one hand, you have the stochastic parrot brigade, those people who believe that large language models are essentially just mirroring or parroting back to us our own inputs and that they're not capable of independent thought in any way. And on the other hand, you have people who believe that even at this stage, these systems, these models are showing glimmers of AGI or artificial general intelligence. That is that they're moving their way towards sentience or may already be sentient. But that's a can of worms for another day. So I think we can probably say that we have a working understanding of what large language models are and how they work without getting too far into the technological weeds. So let's now look at the first letter in the GBT, the generative aspect. What can they produce? And how can it serve us as teachers? Let's look at a series of use cases, that is, active verbs that can be used to describe the kind of outputs that ChatGPT can provide us with. Recommend. Here are 10 novels that would be useful to study as part of a course on dystopian literature. I'm providing a bullet-pointed list and have included the author, date of publication and a brief plot synopsis in each case. Translate. I've translated the following paragraph of English prose into Mandarin, Spanish and Klingon. But you were kidding with the last one, right? Compare. Here are the similarities and differences between the surrealist and impressionist movements. I've included some of the most significant artists and their works and have produced the results as a table with the following headings. Dates, geographical origins, preferred media, themes and stylistic features. Right. As requested, this is a draft email to Year 10 parents, informing them about the parent-teacher conference this Thursday, as outlined in the text you provided. Ideate. Here are three lesson plan outlines to help nine-year-olds better understand the real-world applications of rhetorical techniques. I've made sure that the lessons include individual, paired and whole group activities. Summarise. I've summarised the linked PDF as you asked identifying the key points as a series of numbered short sentences. Research. These are my research findings. I've created five web sources and provided links and citations which are suitable for Year 7 students investigating the causes of World War I. Role play. OK, so for the rest of this conversation, I'll pretend to be Sir Isaac Newton. I'll respond to user questions using the language, tone and knowledge of Newton and I won't reference any understanding of physics that postdates his life. But I suspect my voice might give the game away. Explain. I'd be happy to explain the Gaussian distribution principle so that a ten-year-old can understand. As suggested, I'll produce this as a script in the style of a trending young YouTube influencer. Proofread. I've proofread the text pasted below and have identified several spelling, punctuation and grammar errors. I'll provide these as an ordered list with recommended changes. Assess. Understood. Using the rubric provided, I'll assess the quality of this essay response and assign a grade. Feedback. Of course. I'll write two paragraphs of feedback. The first identifying how the candidate has successfully met the required criteria and the second suggesting ways that the response can be further improved. Code. I'd be happy to code a Python script to read and analyse data from the attached spreadsheet. Calculate. I've calculated the total cost of the proposed educational visit detailed above. If students will be charged 50% of those costs, I've gone on to identify the charge per person, assuming 80 individuals attend. I've presented this as a step-by-step -step breakdown of costs. Mentor. I'd be delighted to suggest some ways in which you might differentiate your teaching resources for students who have English as an additional language. Let's do this as a Socratic dialogue. Organise. You'd like me to organise this list of words into alphabetical order. Thank goodness for that. It's been really bugging me. Here you go. Now, this isn't an exhaustive list, but it does give a flavour of some of the ways in which we might be able to use large language models to lighten the load as teachers. And it's early days for me too, but I'm thinking that there are four primary ways, therefore, that I'm looking to use large language models to help me. The first is in lightening the administrative load. The second is in curriculum planning. The third will be in innovative delivery in the classroom using things such as collaborative writing exercises with ChatGPT. And then finally, I'd be looking at feedback and assessment. Now, that's not to say that these large language models aren't without their limitations. They have them and they're quite significant. And the first one's the principle of garbage in, garbage out. 
If we want a really good quality output, we need to make sure that the data that we're feeding in is presented in a way that gives the large language model the best chance of succeeding in its task. And that's where the idea of prompt engineering comes in. And we'll be looking at that in future episodes. Next, if you're looking for ChatGPT to respond to current affairs or something that's happening in the world right now, you might be a little disappointed. And that's because the data sets that it's trained upon end in September 2021. And there are workarounds, there are plugins, and there are other models that are more able to respond to live links and URLs. Um, but there's room for improvement in this area. Next is the issue of bias, and it's a thorny one because all of the data sets are based upon material from the internet, and the internet reflects us, and we are imperfect beings. We are getting better, I think, on the whole, at embracing ethnicity, diversity, and inclusion, but not all of the material on the internet reflects that effort. And so we need to be mindful when we're working with the outputs of ChatGPT that some of those biases might also be reflected. And then there are issues of data protection. In theory, any material output by ChatGPT can be seen and used by OpenAI engineers and employees to further refine and improve the training of that model. And we'd want that to happen because, after all, we want things to evolve and improve. But we need to be therefore thoughtful about what information we feed in and make sure that there's nothing that might be in breach of the rules and regulations that we as educators abide by. And finally, there's the fascinating phenomenon of hallucinations, because even though these models present themselves as intelligent, they can pass the bar exam, they present as having an IQ of somewhere between 150 and 155, which is greater than 95% of the population in any given country. And yet, sometimes they make the most horrendous errors. If they don't know the answer to something, it's almost as if they'd rather lie to you than tell you the truth and admit that they don't know. Now, this isn't a conspiracy on the part of the machines. I think it's just part of the fact that they're trying to find the next best guess, and any guess is better than no guess, I guess. But perhaps we ought to cut these large language models a little bit of slack. After all, these are their first fledgling steps. It's a brand new technology, and it's very early days in terms of what they're actually capable of. And that brings us to the idea of the future and what it might hold. Imagine a world with truly personalised learning pathways for all of our students, where the models can be carried on their phone and respond in real time to their interests, their needs and their current ability level in any given subject. This might be the technology that allows us to lean into the flipped classroom model and really make it work. Imagine the possibilities if we then combine these large language model neural networks with augmented or virtual reality. You could pop on a headset, go back to ancient Rome, and interview Marcus Aurelius in real time whilst being surrounded by the splendour of the Roman Empire. I also suspect that the kind of inputs accepted by large language models will broaden to include things like audio files and images and video, so that we'll end up with an all-in-one multi-sensory platform with a really easy user interface. The kind of thing you see on Star Trek. And with that, I'm going to wrap things up for today. I hope you found some value in what you've seen and heard. If you did, hit the like button, consider subscribing so we can carry on this journey together. And until next time.